last time we talked about uh, adult responses, and this time we're going to pick up on behavioral experiments and ch children's development and discipline that's positive. So we're going to go through this part, and here is the the the, the B. And Carolyn's going to read that for us. The behaviors children repeat usually begin as innocent experiments. Kyle mentioned experiments. There you have five years of uh, practice experiments. And some of his experiments have worked very well to his satisfaction and others. Page uh, seven. And those experiments won't quit. Uh, actually, we're going to ask a question in two screens from now, and, and I'm going to tell you why you need to re, uh, kind of celebrate those experiments, okay? So we're going to go here to an entertainment factor. Children just love to do things for their own entertainment. And I was at a seminar, and the leader of the seminar actually said these words, and I went to him afterward and asked him if I could include that in our book, and he gave me permission, so here it I'm is. I'm convinced that kids just want life to be interesting. If it isn't, they find ways to make it that way. To the delight of our children, most of us unwittingly oblige them with our responses to the behaviors that they invent for that very purpose. What's the purpose? Fun. And actually, children come back, come by that kind of uh, honestly. We drop them off someplace and we say, Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> or be good. <laughs> so now, let's ask the question why should we focus attention on children's behavior? Now, this is not necessarily a seminar on children's behavior, but. We do talk about behavior, and it is very, very important to understanding children. So we, if you'll go to your page six, at the bottom of the page, there are incomplete phrases, and we're going to help you complete those phrases. Behavior, because a child's behavior, first of all, lets us see inside the child. If you didn't have them behaving in some way or another, you would never see inside what's coming out. Now, let's go to a very, very serious subject for a moment, which is the shootings that we have experienced around the nation and the, the youth who have done the shootings. In the early going, there was a 100% consistency factor in those children. And that consistency factor is the parents never saw it coming. The children didn't let them know through their behavior that this was coming on. So should we be happy that the child is tucking under all his poor or his inferior motivations or sensitivities? Or should we be glad that he actually is expressing those? So when the child is doing things that need correcting, on the one hand, you are being called up to be responsible to help correct things. On the other hand, you are actually to be celebrating the fact that the child has revealed who he is on the inside so that you can do something about it. Think of it like that. And the second one is? Behavior is both cause and effect. Now, we have observed that a child who is allowed to run willy-nilly in a group of other children pretty soon has that whole group of children in disarray. You know, it's, it's just a mess. <laughs> and uh, so that's the child who's uh, creating a cause for other disruption. But he's also showing the effect of inadequate management. 
Is it inadequate control or inadequate management? Well, we define between control and management uh, rather clearly because it is a futile effort to try to control children. It is a worthy effort to manage children. Here is what we mean by that. The more we can teach children to manage themselves, the better we have done our job. If they just re rely on us to manage them, then that is an incomplete job. I had two children running uh, through an inappropriate place. We let them run in our playroom. We have a, a size of a three-car garage where they are quite welcome to run and play and do whatever uh, is appropriate in that area. But they may not run through the classroom or the other parts of our building. And so uh, they were, these two four-year-olds were chasing each other today. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, whose brain are we to be using here? And they both know the answers. I said, would you please show me how that works? And so they throttle it down and walk through the, the room. Now, that required me to call their attention to their need to control themselves. But I did it in such a way that hopefully the next time I will need to give less attention to that and maybe just a look and they will, they will uh, get in touch with their own conscience and manage themselves. We, we find that when we're doing circle time or like children's church, some of you work in children's <coughs> church too, that if you have a noise maker or somebody that's just talking and punching somebody else or something like that, you watch where that uh, center. center of the activity is and then ask them to come stand beside you. Or sit beside you. Or come and sit beside you. But as soon as you get that one person to settle down, quiet himself, come stand beside you, the whole thing changes. It really works. You just get that one center that's bothering, and the whole rest of the class can continue. Good job. <coughs> and number three? Behavior needs influence for the benefit of all. Everyone benefits when child's behavior is managed well. He benefits and everyone around benefits. And the next one is the behavior. This is cool. Behavior is a mirror, oh dear, of adult management. Now, Think about that one a minute. Calvin has said to me too many times, <laughs> your management's not so good <laughs> when th they're mirroring my management. And <laughs> I have things that are, they get chaotic. Have you ever watched kids play? It's really fun to watch kids play. And uh, we have kids who uh, haven't been with us very long and they'll They'll uh, spank their kid, their babies, you know, and they'll talk to them with gruff voices. And others who have been with us longer uh, will take the child to the think space and say, you finish your behavior here, then we'll <laughs> go on. And you can kind of tell, but children listen with their eyes. And that's another article that we wrote that's, uh, that's on the end. That's really, really a great article to process your understanding of how much the children um, follow what we do more than what we say. And so that's how they listen with their eyes. And behavior is a leading trigger for child-adult interaction. We, I've been very uh, privileged to be part of a three-state uh, consortium 
that was working on some kind of a grading system for um, children's early child uh, care environments. And uh, there was a lot of discussion. And they, they made a pie chart of all the various areas that needed to be considered. The uh, facilities, the training of the, the uh, workers, the workers' degrees, the, you know, how they, how they uh, operate their program, their curriculum, and so forth. And one of my colleagues asked, okay, I see all this. Now, what part of this uh, pie chart is consideration of behavior and how, how we uh, interact with our children? And you know what it was? It was one very slim part of 1% of that pie chart. And I thought to myself, and this person actually expressed uh, grief over that. She, Listen, the most important part of the child's growth is his, the quality of his interaction. And you're not evaluating how people interact with the children? And where have you ever gotten training for interaction with children? Well, you're here, but the training isn't very widespread. And so what we want to say is in your evaluation uh, of your interaction with your children, if you think about it, what are you thinking now about what has caused your exchanges? <clears throat> is it more based on some behavioral issue or is it something beyond that? There are so many things to talk about other than behavior and yet behavior often dominates the interactions between youth and adults. And uh, we were giving a talk somewhere and I asked the question, what percentage of your interaction with your children is based on behavior? And this one lady didn't even hesitate. She called out from the middle, middle of the audience. She says, 100%. Because she right away got in touch with the fact how important that behavior issue is in her life and how she needs to elevate that to some other areas of life. You want to talk about Megan's boy for a moment? Carmen's friend about the little boy hitting his sister? Well, I guess so. So Megan was a, a real close friend of our daughter Carmen and she called Carmen one day uh, from a distant city where uh, she was living with her husband and a three-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. And the five-year-old girl had a new doll and the three-year-old boy wanted to play with it. So he yanked it away from his sister and the sister yanked it back. And as three-year-olds might tend to do, the three-year-old gave his five-year-old sister a good whack across the arm and and mommy was uh, watching from a little distance away and she walked over to the young boy and thinking that she really needed to do something about this. And so she took his little hand and in his hand and gave it a slap and startled, he looked up at her and said, mommy, no hit. <laughs> okay, so where does this figure in? What's that little guy likely to do in correcting the behavior of his doll? He's going to follow the adult behavior. And when we show you the Think Space video in a couple of weeks, you will see one child strike another child. He was the only child in our group that we know the parents still were spanking their children. So that was how he interpreted he needed to be uh, correcting 
his child. Some behaviors that begin as experiments, fussing, stubbornness, temper tantrums, negative attitude, disrupt, disruptiveness, whining, pouting, and arguing. Has anybody had an argument with a four-year-old recently? Did you win? Here's the thing. Young children have less interest in accuracy or truth, and they have more interest in capturing your, your uh, attention, if you will, capturing your reaction to what they're saying. And often they will pursue an argument just so that they uh, see what you will do with it. And again, the whole idea of seeing what it takes to make another person react to them. Concept C, page eight. It is better to help a child develop from the inside out than the outside in. So here is where we take a brief look into what it takes to do the inside out thing. It's really, really easy to be telling our children what to do, when to do, where to go, how to go, and so forth because we know what we want from the children and we think that's our responsibility. However, it is also our responsibility to develop their brains and their wills and their character. And just getting them to do whatever we say is not necessarily developing their brains, will, and character. So here is the indirect method. We are not necessarily crossing out. Uh, well. I guess we could say we don't use threats at all anymore. Uh, orders and commands lose their, their priority with us when we have these other tools. Guiding we, with questions and quiet corrections. And then we also have the tool called yes. Uh, for example, uh, it's five minutes before supper. And the child says, Mommy, 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 I'm so hungry. I need something to eat. I want some cookie. You have that cookie there. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. And so your answer naturally would be something like, Of course not. It'll hurt your appetite. But you could say, Oh, yes, you may have the cookie after supper and so would you like to keep it on this shelf over here or on that shelf over there now you've given the child a valid choice you've given him an answer that's a positive answer as opposed to uh, giving an answer that pre creates an unnecessary pushback and your focus on the future does that make any sense? Yeah. If so. you catch yourself saying no, think yes and give your qualification. Yeah. Just change it right in the middle of the, you can even say no. And they say, oh yeah, I think we could say yes and then give the qualification. And so we're gonna treat more of this down the line but that's part of what we mean by this indirect management. But again, the whole idea of indirect management is more often than not through the use of the appropriate question. And Calvin gave that example the first week and I always try to repeat it because it took me a long time to get it. And that's, I was quite a, a commander. You would think I'd been in the service or something. Because go put that truck over there, do this, do that. I did it so much. And when he fa had that one example of the little boy's grandma saying, it's time to go, let's go, put that truck over there. And he said, let me help. And he said, where does that truck belong? And then he said, would you please show me where that truck goes? And I'll tell you, if you try that, it'll help you so much. Did you try it? Great. Yeah. With the two-year-old. 
What is it to you? Five-year-old. I said two-year-old loves it. Well, the five-year-old would still like to show you things. Well, you'd think. Yeah. Someday. Someday. <laughs> okay, I, we'd ought to have a conversation with you on the five-year-old. Oh, okay. we can talk. <laughs> so let's do that. Make up a time for us to get together. Concept D. Children need guidance and discipline in their lives for the safe and healthy development of their potential. Uh, hardly anybody will counter that, say, nah, just let them raise themselves. Yeah. Of course, that wouldn't include any of you because you're here for some kind of guidance and help. However, where the discussion comes in is what kind of guidance, what kind of discipline. And uh, we, had a, we had a couple a uh, few years ago come in with a very hard to manage child who was a, a um, he was actually adopted. It, not the same couple that we talked about earlier, but another grandparent uh, situation where they had adopted a child. <coughs> and so this was a representation of the fact that they hadn't done so well with their child who had fluked out and now they had to raise a child of the child, right? But these people presumed to tell, uh, after the child was enrolled with us, presumed to tell us how to raise that child and what to do with the child and, and you know wanted to dictate to us what was going on. Well they had a particular group of, of ideas that hadn't worked out so well with the other child but they were going to use the same things on this next child. So we, we got crossways with the people and they decided that we weren't a good fit for them and we agreed. <laughs> because they were not teachable, but the, the fact that this is a very, very volatile area was revealed to me when I was sharing some of these things with my uh, very loved uh, uncle, and we had uh, two four-hour uh, plane flights, and so near the end of the, f the uh, last plane flight, uh, he said, now, Cal, I love everything you're saying. And this is before we put any of this on paper and things, it was just still in the head. And he says, I love everything you're saying, but are you ready for lots of controversy? I said, how so? He says, because there are so many attitudes out here about how to raise kids. <coughs> and he says, you better be ready for a lot of controversy. And I will say that after we started going public with these things, we got, we got uh, some smash hit, you know, some great letters that, uh, you know, just were really, really critical. And uh, as we've gone along, that's become less and less. But it just underlined the fact that there are so many attitudes out here that deal with raising children. So we're going to uh, just focus on a, a line of thought here that may help to bring a lot of things into focus. And here is... The kind of guidance they receive has a huge impact on the kind of people they become. Now, the first thing we're going to consider is negative guidance and discipline. And that gives you a fear-based behavior. The child fears us. If we're does does a child follow what we say because of a fear of, of uh, you know, some unpleasant thing happening if, we, if they don't do what we say? Or are they doing it out of respect for what we are saying? And I know the fear thing when it comes to theology has a lot of nuances. And I don't want to get in the weeds on the nuances of what fear means. <coughs> But the place where I'm going with this is that it is possible to raise children with such a respect factor for us that they fear disappointing us or fear 
violating the things that we have laid down that are positive in their life. And you know what? That's the kind of child we want. Not the one that fears getting, uh, does what we ask because he fears getting grounded for the next two weeks. So we're going to help you divide between those two things. And then the second one is? Positive guidance and discipline brings about confidence-based behavior. Now, I, since we're in a church environment, I love the passage where Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And our former pastor, uh, Rob Reimer, uh, came to my house one day with his computer full of uh, uh, very high level uh, commentaries and so forth. He says, I want to work with you on this for a while. And so we, we worked on that. And there was one commentary that said the compilation of the power, love, and a sound mind, or the, it, it all points toward confidence. And I kind of picked up on that because what we are wanting to do is raise children who have a confident disposition because they are following the inner voice that God has given them and they have followed our instruction and now they are developing an attitude of confidence. And there's no silver bullet in this. Uh, in other words, there's not just one thing involved. It's all these things put together. But if I might just say that children who have been under this kind of guidance, when they leave our environment, which becomes a de facto laboratory, they uh, almost always are de facto leaders wherever they go because they have confidence. And if you talk to any psychologist, what's the, one of the main things that determines how successful a person's going to be in life? It's the attitude of confidence. And so we're going to sh show you how to uh, use these tools toward building a confident person that goes out into the world and uh, lives and guides other people with confidence. Some of the damages of negative discipline guidance. <coughs> Maybe you can call it out. <coughs> call, talk okay, to I already gave you the first one. When you think of negative discipline and negative guidance, what are some of the things that happen to people and maybe you can uh, think of yourself. You might have received some negative discipline and you say, boy, that sure set me back. And so what are the kind of things that get set back? What are some of the outcomes? What do you think? You can just go holler them out don't, and I'll repeat them. Are you thinking? What? Okay, let's look at this. Poor self-image. Hidden anger. Hurting relationships. Negative disposition. Unresolved fears. Low achievement. Lower achievement than might have been there had they not had so much or had you not had so much negative guidance. We were teaching this and we had two doctors in the room <coughs> and they said, oh my goodness, um, almost all of our training is based on fear and negative <coughs> motivation. And they said, uh, uh, we really could take some more lessons along this line. So let's, let's move along now to something that is a common <coughs> thing when people talk about discipline, is it usually in a negative or positive context? 
Well, it's a given, right? It's usually negative. I'm going to discipline you. What do they mean? They mean... Uh, use your escape. Way over? Yeah. There you go. Here's, they mean, uh, and you're supposed to have answered punishment, right? <laughs> so what are some typical punishments that we use with children? Now, I'm not asking you necessarily, maybe your neighbor. <laughs> okay, so what are they? Spanking. Spanking. Huh? Time out. <coughs> Taking privileges. Taking privileges away. Yeah. All of those things. How about go to your room? Okay, you got them. Now, here's the deal. All of those things have a, have a pattern. They all look backward at what went wrong. People have never been punished for what's going forward. They always punished well, except for one. <laughs> I heard of a father who incorrectly uh, spanked his child, and his wife called his hand on it because he, the child had actually done something right. Well, he said, well, that spanking is just for the next time you did something wrong. <laughs> so we can't be 100% true. <laughs> but here's the deal. When we think about punishment, uh, I wrote a paper here. If you'll go to the page nine, there's a paper here that details four areas that <coughs> point up how ineffective punishment is as a teacher. And when we, when we punish people, there, it's expected to be a teaching experience, but in a macro sense, in fact, the thing that took us off of time out was a, and that's a punishment, what took us out of time out and started us thinking, this is not really working, and yet it's validated and supported by the state of Kansas. And we said, look at these kids. They go in time out, and they come out and do the same thing, only worse. And That's then we got to looking at the macro effect, and over and over, you see people incarcerated, and then they come out of their prison terms. What do they do? The same thing, only worse. And so that undermines the notion that punishment is supposed to be a great teacher, and here's why it fails to teach very well. It, Say that one. First of all, it's <laughs> The a, calculated cost of fun. Remember the thing that Carolyn read a while ago? Life she, just wants to be interesting, fun. That's right. And so what we want to do, instead of, ha <coughs> of uh, fostering those fun components that are based on bad behavior is we want to help the children develop some new motivations within them that are talking to them. And the second one... What did you explain about the fun? Well, we read that. Did you want to... I want you to say what you <coughs> thought about at first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this whether I get spanked or not. I'm going to do this because I would rather take a punishment and have fun than to say it. That's good. Well, that's what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me again. <laughs> because I really think that's true. A lot, of, a lot of kids say, I would rather be spanked or I would rather take a punishment and still have some fun than to get what I'm going to get. So they, they are looking out for the fun effect and they say that the cost of that fun is going to be worth it. Yeah, be worth it. So the binding effect now. When we say, go to your room 
think about what you did, what are we doing? We're asking the child to secure his thinking so that he will be thinking on the negative side. We want him to think about what? What he could do better next time. And so that's the replacement principle. The third one. What not to do. This is a biggie, everybody. This is what you're going to need work on this week. We tell them what not to do rather than what to do. Isn't that the natural first thing that we do when we see a child doing something inappropriate? Don't throw the rocks. Keep the rocks on the ground. Don't jump on the bed or jump on the couch. Don't do that. Keep your feet on the floor. But see, we say the negative one or what not to do so much more than the positive good one. Well, here's that why made we a do big that. Impression on me. Here's why we do that. Because we see something going wrong and we speak straight to the wrong. To tell to say to the child what we'd like for him to do requires an additional line of thought. <coughs> to think. And I can't tell you the number of parents <coughs> who we have met with and they're expressing their distress over something's that the child is doing and they said well I said well what do you want the child to do instead and they'll say oh I don't know I know what I want them not to do but I can't really tell you what I want the child to do so it's no wonder that their instruction has gone south because they're not even sure in themselves what they want the child to do instead of what they're doing, you see? And so that can be, as Carolyn said. That should be on your assignment. A really, really big assignment for you. And uh, make, make that a, a major thing for you to concentrate on what to do as opposed to what not to do. This is the daycare provider asking this question. Okay, speak you up. Said, oh, you speak up, me? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> sh Carolyn, you mentioned the rock thing. Okay, this just happened today. Um, well, you know, I have that big rock. Everybody's allowed to play with the rocks. That's not the thing. Um, my one-year-old cannot conceive not to throw. I'm having a lot of dreadful. I'm not asking you about how to do that. That's just going to be constant rep <laughs> repetition for me. But today, I said, please put the rocks down. Rocks belong on the ground. Gears, I gave her a cup. She, she's fine. I turned my head, and she threw the rock, hit the baby in the head. Now, her, his mom is really cool. I am very lucky. He's got a nice little shiner right between the eyes. Now, I'm, I'm saying not to, in my business, sometimes you have to really say no. Say no really quick and really angry. <laughs> and what else, to, what are my choices? Now it's here, I can open mind, I can try to program myself. But at the time, I was furious because we'd just gone through all these things about putting the rock down and play. I showed her how to play with the rocks. And as soon as I turned away, she pitched one. Now, she didn't try to hit the baby. She's not even aware of where the rock's going to go. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you're speaking to a huge area right here. Uh, however, the, f the first thing that comes to mind is children uh, who throw, have learned to throw, are... Uh, actually doing something that is very, very complicated physiologically. Okay, to get the motion and to release their object and for it to become a projectile is something that is very uh, advanced in terms of animal behavior. Okay, so I celebrate that. Okay, and uh, we 
we have children who just love to throw, okay? So we have created places for them to throw things. And that's where we're going to uh, utilize that throwing activity. Now, I can't guarantee that they're not going to ever throw anything inappropriate, but when I give them that outlet for throwing and I explain to them this is where we throw, then that takes the edge off of throwing somewhere else. Okay. The second, second thing is uh, <clears throat> to intercept. You're, you're close to your children all the time. You can't necessarily be with all of them all the time. But <clears throat> to try to be where the child would be throwing and you intercept that. Okay. Then whether you are uh, able to intercept that or not, you, you can still uh, take that rock back and say, honey, here's what we do with the rock. We put it on the ground. Or if there's a place that you have designated to throw the rock, you take the child over there and have them throw over in that area. The third thing is that you need to have the child participate in healing or, or soothing the hurt child. Now, did you do that? Okay. And so now you have an opportunity. Now you have a choice to, to whether you're going to talk to the child who threw the rock about how bad behavior that was or whether you're going to talk about how the other child feels hurt. And okay. then get a little boo-boo bunny or an ice cube wrapped and help them hold it on somebody. Actually help them hold if they're not too little. Okay. So there's three, three things that I've given you there. Okay. All right. The last one. Fear base, positive base. Well, we've talked about the fear base, but here's, here's an illustration. Almost every child likes for the daddy to go fast in the car. Children love to go fast, right? And they say, daddy, go fast. And you look around and you say, well, I don't know. I, there might be a policeman around here. That's a fear-based decision. <coughs> now, we come by that pretty naturally because we live in a world of laws. However, there is a higher way of responding to that. And that is to say to the child, see that speed limit sign right over there? 45 miles an hour? The people who make rules for our roads have decided that that is as fast as it is safe to go on the road. And so we're going to be honoring that rule because that's for our own safety. So one is core thinking and the other is fear-based thinking. And you can do that with a lot of things with the children as they ask you to do things. So it's a fear base. Are you answering with a fear base or are you answering with a rational, reasoned, or core base type of thinking, positive thinking? And that's that for that page. Um, so with that behind us, this is all about why punishment is a relatively poor teacher, we're going to go on to all the positive things that we do as we go along. Now, yeah. look at this. The new low stress mindset on guidance and discipline. We're moving away from what not to do. <coughs> moving from punishment to an event or a point in time. Okay, now first, next, let's ask you the question, why would we be using a tortoise up here? Because we all 
change real slowly. Wouldn't it be nice if we could change ourselves just like we change computers? You know, flick a button and then it's on another program. However, humans aren't uh, that way. We gradually make these changes. And so, uh, so far as the husband-wife relationship is concerned, uh, one of you is going to hang on to some of these things uh, more quickly than others. And we all need to be patient with one another as we make our way toward the goal of getting really good at what we're doing here. So we're mo moving from what not to do to... What to do. Moving from punishment to... Guidance. Moving from an event or point in time to... Everything we do to guide our children. Just think about that. <coughs> what is your discipline policy in your home? Everything we do to guide our children. Kevin wants to tell the health department that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to redefine discipline then so that it encompasses this broader idea. And here it is. Let's look at it like this. What is that? An arrow or a, what kind of sign? Stop sign? Right. Stop sign. Okay. Now, let's move it one at a time. Training a child to stop or avoid one thing to do another for a future benefit. <coughs> And it's, again, on the bottom, <coughs> the bottom line is everything we do to guide our children. And so, Guidance. in a real sense, discipline becomes a lifestyle as opposed to an event or point in time. But it's based on positive guidance in our perspective, not on do it or else. Not fear-based. Now, if you'll go to page 11, we're going to give you a little science lesson here. And some of you may have seen this. Uh, it's not necessarily new, but it's new to a lot of eyes. And <laughs> here is why we suggest to you that correcting a child at, in the heat of a moment is probably not a teachable moment. And the reasons are here in this picture. First of all, let's concentrate on three main areas of reception of information when things go on around the child. The first one is a limbic system. Now that's a system of nine to 11 glands that are right in the middle of the brain, but they are the traffic cops for where, which direction incoming data is going to be sent. And it's going to be sent either to the cerebral cortex <coughs> where rational processing takes place, or it's going to be sent to the brain stem. Now, there is a lot of research that's been done and a lot of new discoveries regarding the brain stem in the last 20, 25 years of brain science. And unfortunately, most of what we spend our time in terms of uh, correction of our children in the heat of the moment is not going to the brain cerebral cortex, but to the brain stem. The problem with it going to the brain stem is that it creates an automated response. In other words, there's this emotional dance that you may be able to relate to. The child does one thing, 
you react to the child, the child does the next thing, you do the next thing, and pretty soon it escalates. And it's a repeated pattern over and over and over again. And now a pattern has been set that is dictated by the brain stem which is learned behavior. There are other terms that are given to that, one of which is the lizard brain. In other words, when a lizard senses danger, the lizard tucks under and hides. We can't do that so ably as a lizard insofar as hiding physically, but our children hide emotionally very quickly. And so the rest of your verbiage becomes white noise in the home and it means nothing except that the next time something happens, then they, the brain references that learned behavior and there's an automated response. Now, unlearning all that stuff is a very difficult task. So we want to contribute as little as possible to the brain stem and go toward the, the cerebral cortex as much as possible. The way to get information into the cerebral cortex is by talking to the brain in uh, softer moments in taking advantage of the relaxation principle. Now all of life works on tension and relaxation. I cannot tell you the number of times that I used to talk to my mother, and I was never a great math student, but I found solace and comfort in talking to my mother about my math problems, not because she was a math whiz, but because it helped me relax, and pretty soon I had the answer. Uh, I cannot also tell you the number of times that I've had a huge computer problem that I wish that Kyle would have been around for, but I, I went to bed not solving the problem and I woke up having the answer. Wherein lies the secret to that? Relaxation. So the, the heat of the moment is your tension point. Your relaxation comes later. And there are two points that the child is more receptive to communication in, than any other place. There's this psychological grid that closes in the heat of the moment because they're sheltering themselves from further psychological damage. And then it opens up just before they go to sleep and just after they wake up. So those are key times to talk to children about things that have gone on that they need to process in the cerebral cortex. Would you ask me uh, through the microphone? I was just saying, could you repeat that? Just before they go to sleep. No, and right there. after they wake up. Right that's yeah. when they're most receptive yeah. to talking without hiding. Yeah. And, and then there are other times too, your lap times, your, your uh, story time, you know, when they're relaxed. But um, there's this theory that uh, the teachable moment occurs right at the time that something has gone wrong. In most cases, that is not the most teachable moment. If you do manage to teach something, it's going to be based on fear. And so we want to be real cautious about that. So what we recommend is getting through the, the crisis, whatever small or large crisis it might be, and you do that with as few words as possible and just get past it, and then you talk to the child after everything is settled down. That's one of the missions of the think space, by the way. It's based on the relaxation principle. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, now we can move on to another picture.
and it's just going to illustrate this and I'm going to let it play out. Here it is. Incoming data. Then it goes either to the brain cerebral cortex or the brain stem. And you go ahead and you have that picture on your notebook there. This really helps me relax when children have done something off the wall, you know, because I really want to nail them right there, you know. <laughs> I, I want to nail the moment. But I have come to realize that I'm going to get further in a relaxed moment than I would ever get in the heat of the moment. <coughs> that behind us, here is the objective, communication without conflict and... Communication with confidence. And here's the gentle reminder, watch this. I never said it would be easy. I said it would be worth it. And so the question again comes, just how good do you want to become at this task, you know? Not easy, but worth it. Now, we're going to give you an introduction to our next sections, and we'll get into the next. The next uh, 14 things that we do are going to be tabs, and uh, we'll be moving right along through the tabs. This first tool is one of the easiest tools to use. And another thing you should really try this week. Okay, and I might say that these tools are kind of skewed so that the easiest one is at the front and the most difficult one is at the back. So here we go with the easiest now, one. Are you going to explain quick contact? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, on your page two, if you go to page two, I'll just explain the table of contents briefly. Your section one is all about introductory information and we will we'll hit some of that in each session. And then your section two starts the tabs of the tools. And uh, there are four quick contact <coughs> tools in this, first, in this second section. They are get ready, get set. Positive redirection, three choice drill, the perfect choice, and the extended contact one is quiet correction. That's because it takes longer to really uh, do some of that activity, although quiet correction can also be a quick contact tool. <coughs> and here are the sections uh, that we're going to talk about, or the subjects we're going to talk about in each of uh, these sections. Uh, number two uh, is get ready, get set, as we said, positive redirection, three choice drill, perfect choice, quiet correction, and here is the first one. Page 17, giving a child advance notice about an upcoming change of activity or focus for any new child that comes into our class or even our home. What hurts some of the children's feelings the most is to leave one activity and have to change <coughs> to something else, whether it's just playtime or going to dinner or going to bath or going to bed. Many times we get fusses when we go changing the procedure, what comes next. So get ready, get set, says in 10 minutes, it's going to be bath time. We're going to take a, or in in five minutes we're going to church so we need to get our things ready to go or you may have five more minutes on the slide and when that's over we need to go and we will go and then you keep your word you do it on the exact time as, as you can because this helps a child Finally learn what five minutes means, 10 minutes, how does it feel? And back to the diaper incident, when you give heads up about this, 
It's a ramp up and ramp down. The, the people who build our highways know this. Uh, they give us signs that in two weeks, this certain road's gonna be closed. Uh, we do this routinely with a lot of things. Uh, when we go to the opera, um, you hear, you're in the lobby at, at uh, break time and you hear that doom, 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 doom. The little chimes go off and it gives you the signal that you need to be making your way back to the, your seats. And what we do with our children, on the other hand, so often is look at our clock and say, oh, we got to do the next thing. We got to go. And we, we just yank the children away from their activity, whatever it is, without regard to the need to ramp up or ramp down <coughs> to something. And you'll find th that a very high percentage of conflicts between children and the adults in their lives is about change. You analyze that in your own home and see if that's not accurate. And so if we give you a wonderful way to ramp up or ramp down to something and reduce that change, have we contributed to your, your well-being in your family? Of course. It's, here's the deal. Um, you can find all kinds of places where you use this. And as Carolyn has said, when you say two or three minutes, uh, two minutes, don't say two or three minutes, say two minutes or three minutes and then honor that time period because the children are learning their value of time and space from what you say. Now, there are some things that you probably would not say you know, along that line, which is pretty soon or maybe or something like that. One of the things that people with special needs children learn along the way is that they get along much better with their, their special needs children if they are exact with their words. And it occurs to me that we'd get along with all of our children better if we would use the exactitude that is required of special needs parents. In fact, uh, we've spoken as you can imagine, hundreds of places, in almost every place we speak, someone comes up who has a special needs child. And they're not looking for pity, ever, that we have found. But they're validating what we're saying. Because they say, we have learned to be so much better parents by having a special needs child. Because we've learned to be exact, we have learned to be positive, we have learned to uh, follow through with what we say because children who categorize in the special needs area don't have as good a shock absorbers as, quote, normal children. And the forgiveness factor doesn't work as well in those children as it does in uh, other children that that easily uh, overlook things that are problems or that we do inappropriately as parents. Now, where did we get on that? The get ready, get set. That's another thing Guidelines. that they tell us. <clears throat> There's a signal for change, or none of, like we said, number of minutes, or finishing, when you finish your puzzle, they were gonna leave or put your doll in the doll bed, and then we're going, finish a task. Attitude adjustment. When, when, sometimes, when you need to sometimes a child, uh, it's not so nice with his parent. And um, we had a mother who was getting ready to take the child uh, home and he didn't want to go home, and he started beating on her. And I said, wait a minute here, you know. It looks like we need an attitude adjustment. And she said, you can say that again. And so I said, do you have a minute? And she said, yeah, sure. 
So I took the child to the think space to settle down. I said, when you're finished with your, with your um, upset here, then we can go to your mom and we can start all over again. I'm going to tell you that story. We will tell you that story under another category. But you know what? That child had a chance to settle down. That's an attitude adjustment. And that's just as valid a thing. So Carolyn said a number of minutes or finishing a task, some puzzle or something, or an <coughs> attitude adjustment, make the conditions <coughs> realistic. Make the conditions clear and follow through with what you've said. So. And we need to show them the strengths and the limitations. limitations. And then I'm going to give you practice what we preach. We've got three minutes left before we need to yeah. let them go. And so here, <laughs> on, your, on your second page of this, uh, you have these strengths. And... Uh, this last one encourages the completion of a task. So often I hear parents talking about their teenagers and they, that they're not thorough in what they do and in the elementary school about not being thorough in what they do. But can you think back to the number of times that you've yanked a child away from some task he was doing because it all at once became time to do something else? Well, we're undermining the notion that it's important to complete a task. Now, there's a Montessori idea, uh, Maria Montessori, who we reference from time to time, talked about work cycles. And so we need to be aware that children have work cycles. Now, we can't necessarily be beholden to their work cycles all the time. And that's the role of get ready, get set. Help them, give them a time frame for ramping down and uh, ramping up to something else. So now we're going to give you a few limitations and you have those on your, your paper, but right now we're going to ask you to write down a bunch of places where you can use this in your home starting tonight or tomorrow morning. And we're gonna give you one clock minute of chimes that you'll have the opportunity to write these things down. So would you please write them down now?